Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Little. I hope you're having a fantastic day. Today, we are gonna be discussing three hacks to help you crush high stakes poker. They are hammering over my head today. So we are gonna be experimenting with the audio volume so that hopefully you all cannot hear it. We are actually going to be quizzing you all. Today, we are gonna be going through three high stakes hands featuring poker coaching coaches that they played recently that I probably would have messed up. And I bet a lot of you are going to mess up. So let's get right to it. We are playing in the middle levels of a $15,000 buy-in tournament at Triton. Hopefully y'all can hear this. Sounds real. I'm pretty good at faking it. <laughs> How do you think I made it this far? <laughs> <laughs> like in a 7-5 offsuit in the small blind. Saliba awaits his procedures. Lycanon, good, strong, world-class, high-stakes online cash game and tournament crusher, mostly shorthanded, mostly heads up. He opts to limp from the small blind. He is playing pretty deep stacked. Justin Saliba, poker coach and coach, currently number five poker player in the world in poker tournaments. He has about 15 big blinds with the eight, four off suit. You know what you should do here? You know what you should do here? Take some time, think about it. I'll go ahead and tell you, you should raise it some small portion of the time. Some people never raise. A lot of people check every single time with the 8-4 offsuit with 15 big blinds. But in this spot, you should be raising with all your best hands and a mixture of junky offsuit garbage. Okay? So mix it up. Let's see what Justin does. Which involve flatting. It feels so dirty to make it three big blinds here. <laughs> Uncomfortable seat. You have two of the biggest crushers on each side of you. Right? You're bookended by... Alpha, he's got a game. Look at this. 8-4 offsuit. Like this. He does race. Saliba's no slouch. No, he's not. Number five tournament player in the world. Poker coach and coach. He contributes tons of content to PokerCoaching.com. He's good at poker. I mean, you said he was a slouch in mixed games the other day, but... No, 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 no. He said he was a, a newcomer to mixed games. Okay. How much did he make it? You can see very clearly on the screen. You raised to 60,000. The blinds are 10,000, 20,000. You made it three big blinds. Like an obstacle call with the 7-5 offsuit. This is loose. This is splashy. But all right. So he's limp called here, right? With 7-5 offsuit. Like an indeed. Investing another 40,000. Getting sticky out of position, but has Saliba well covered here, so the damage is capped in case of emergency. I suppose he feels he can maneuver post-flop. If it comes high cards, likely to hit that big blind who raids off the 15 big blind stack. He thinks his cards are live. <coughs> A lot of these cash game players are just very comfortable playing post-flop. Cash game players are sticky, is what the commentator here means. So in this scenario, flop comes nine, eight, five. First question for all of you. Should Lycanon have a leading range in this scenario? What do you think? What do you think? Take a second, think about it. Write it in the chat while you're here. This is going to be an interactive show. Why not make it an interactive show today? Should Lycanon have any leads in this scenario? Pretty good flop form, I would think. If you all have studied the tournament masterclass and the advanced tournament course at PokerCoaching.com, you will know that you very often do want to lead when the board is extremely good for your range, and you do want to lead when stacks are very shallow effectively. I would actually guess a pretty good amount of leads here, and I looked it up because I wasn't sure, but I should have been sure because I've already studied this stuff. I'm going to show you Lycanon's flop range in this scenario. Take a look at this. This is the Game Theory Optimal Strategy. All right, the dark red hands. 30% of Lycanon's range should rip it all in. Wild. 24% of his hands should bet one big blind, and the rest should check. So what wants to just shove all in on 9-8-5? Take a look at this range. It is a lot of nines and a lot of eights. 
a lot of nines and a lot of eights. And then some bluffs. What are the bluffs? What are bluffs on 985? Well, obviously gut shots and open-endeds, you would think. Funny enough, though, open-endeds don't actually shove. Those use a small bet when they bet. I guess because they can bet and then call it off. It looks like more of the gut shots are shoving. So we see queen eight shoving a lot. We see random over cards with back door draw. King eight and king seven shoving a lot. Jack seven. That, make, that makes sense. So look, in, in scenarios like this, whenever I'm studying these spots, I'm always trying to find the hands that would make a play that I would not naturally make the play with. And if you ask me, should I open shove here with the king seven offsuit? I would have told you no way in the world should I be shoving two X pot with the king seven offsuit. And that would have been wrong. Right? It is a gut shot. I guess it is a gut shot. It is a gut shot. It is an overcard. Gut shot and overcard, I guess, is good enough. Gut shot and overcard is sometimes good enough. Fun stuff. Notice we see lots of top and middle pairs, though, shoving. That does make a whole lot of sense. Um, That's about it, really. Gut shots and pairs. Not open-endeds, though. Open-endeds are good enough for the small bet. What hands are betting small? Well, super good hands, right? These are hands that don't really care if Justin sticks around. That's going to be a lot of 9-8, 9-5, 8-5, very obviously. Then also, lots of small bets with some weaker gut shots, right? Like 6-4. The nice thing about having king 6 or queen 6 or king 7 or queen 7 is that if you get a king or a queen, you're almost always good, right? But if you have a hand like 6-4 or 6-3, if you get a 4 or 3, you're not necessarily good. So these hands are not quite good enough to jam, right? So it seems like a lot of super good hands are leading small. Also, a lot of marginal made hands with fives. And then also a lot of the bad draws. Notice over here we have some backdoor draws leading small as well. Ten high, jack high, four high, king high. Just king high air balls going for the best. Is that what you're supposed to do? I would bet almost no one does that. Even super duper world class players. Like an in check. Should he even have 7-5 offsuit in his preflop range? He should. He should have limp called this a large chunk of the time. Notice 7-5 would go for the small bet. I have to imagine it's not going to fold if it does get raised. This is interactive. Don't forget, we are live. Everyone says, is there a delay? Yes, it's a, there's a one-second delay today. I apologize for the one-second delay. I don't control the internet. But here we are. Let's see how this progresses. But it seems like a good flop. Yeah. Actually, he's in trouble. He's got the gun. He checks. What should Justin do in this scenario with the 8-4 offsuit? Take a second, think about it, write it in the chat. Is there anybody here today? Is no one even here? If you're all here, click the like and subscribe button. Let me know. If no one's here, we'll just go home. I mean, I have stuff to do. I stopped making a webinar, a PowerPoint for PokerCoaching.com to make this, this webinar for all of you today. Hopefully you're all here. Hopefully you're all going to interact. Bet small, bet small, bet small. Okay, let's see what he should actually do. In the scenario, 8-4 offsuit should check. Who'd have thought? 8-4 offsuit is down here. Um, this is Saliba's range. All of the hands that are not gray are played. And like I said, preflop, his raising range is going to be all the best hands. And then a smattering of offsuit nonsense. So this is a spot where apparently... Middle pair, bad kickers should not be bet. And of course, bottom pair, bad kickers should probably not be bet as well. So what are we betting here? We're betting pair with gut shot and better. For a middle pair with a gut shot and better, something like that. Obviously, we're betting lots of top pairs, good, good middle pairs, over pairs. What about gut shots? We don't actually have a lot of gut shots. Notice in the spot, though, most of the gut shots are not actually betting because they don't want to bet and then get jammed. Kind of cool, right? Notice even a hand like Jack-10 is not betting because it doesn't want to bet and get jammed. If you do bet in the spot, which you are betting infrequently, you are betting three and a half big blinds, so half pot mostly. Whenever you look at all of these we're going to be going through today, you see bet 35. That means bet 3.5 big blinds. Let me try to make it simple. So bet 3.5 big blinds. Bet 13 is all in. Bet 18 is bet 1.8 big blinds. So you see, though, not a lot of betting, but when we do bet, we usually have a pretty good made hand or a draw. And the reason for that is because this flop heavily favors the opponent, right? When this flop heavily favors the opponent, this is a situation where you don't get to bet all that often, and when you do bet, you bet somewhat polarized, okay? Notice, though, we do see some slivers of bets with all the eights randomly, you know? Whatever. 
gut shot and bottom pair, but unfortunately for him, he's up against second pair. And funny enough, like if I was in Justin's shoes, I would have bet, thinking I can just bet and call it off. But I think the issue here is this flop is so good for Lycanin that I guess you're just not supposed to bet all that often, which is kind of frustrating. It feels kind of dirty checking it back with an eight here. Any eight, because it's probably good, right? And you're relatively shallow. But um, that's that. Is anything that's jam worthy now going to limp preflop? I'm not sure what you mean, road test. And this isn't the territory that Saliba's preflop raise is supposed to be associated with. Commentator just says, this is not the range that Saliba's range is supposed to be associated with, but I disagree to some extent. Notice he has all this stuff, right? I think a lot of people think, oh, the raise means he has a good hand. No, the raise means he has this range, right? And notice this range actually does have some connects here. And like over pairs are clearly good, right? And top pairs are clearly good. Of course. Justin. I think a lot of people get it in their heads that you're representing something. You're representing a good hand when you raise. But you're not representing a good hand. You're representing this range, right? So realize you're not representing only the nuts. You're representing this. That includes a lot of trash. Was looking if you're to good. take it down pre. I mean, he's happy he's paired his eights. It is not a comfortable board. I'm tempted to bet to protect your hand, and you don't also want to bet and get jammed on, which is annoying. Seven. It's just uncomfortable. Seven, that's in 70,000. He bets 70,000, half pot. So he does select the right bet size, but he goes a little bit too wide. And you know, look, I don't fault him for that. Notice uh, half pot is the size most likely used. Mark says you're jamming it all in. Notice, almost no hands jam it all in here. It's important to realize, whenever you're studying GTO strategies, you're very rarely going to be perfect, right? But if you can get kind of close, that's going to be fine. But the idea of I would have shoved this hand preflop I'm sorry, I would have shoved this hand on the flop. Notice that's nowhere near GTO at all, right? Which means it's probably just not a good play. When you make a play that is close or on the cusp of playability, like right here, we see 8-6 and 8-7 using some bigger bets. We see Ace-8 using some big bets and King-8 and Queen-8 and Jack-8, right? So we see hands kind of like this using big bets. Whenever you make this bet, it's not like you're losing much EV. You're losing some, but not much. If you bet with something that like never bets, like, um, notice 6-5 basically never bets and no hands really near it bet. That's probably going to be a decent mistake. Or hand like King-Queen or King-Jack. These are hands that almost never bet or King-10. So that's probably going to be a pretty big mistake. Um, but betting this spot, if it is a mistake, it's going to be minimal. All right, let's proceed. What should Lycanon do? What do you think? Actually, kind of a tough spot. Should Lycanon raise? He's obviously not folding. Should he raise? I'd venture to say no. What do you think? Lycanon, 7's 5 offsuit should call mostly or rip it all in. Um, notice there are some min raises, which is interesting. Most people never min raise here. That's a 7.7 .7 big blinds when your opponent has 10 left. <laughs> it's kind of nuts to think that you would min raise here with anything. But notice this is actually kind of crazy. Some hands are probably min raise folding, I guess, right? What is min raise folding here? What can justify min raise folding? I don't know anything. I don't know. GTO's, GTO's tough when you're playing shallow stacked. A lot of people think that GTO play with short stacks is just all under fold. And uh, you would be very, very wrong. It gets really delicate, really intricate. And look, in this spot, I probably would have shoved or called everything. And to be fair, if you did that, it's probably not that big of a deal. Obviously, fold some stuff too. But this is a spot where it makes a lot of sense for him to shove his best hands plus some draws. Draws are going to be some hands like Jack-10. Like, good draws, right? jack Ten's shoving. Pairs with gut shots are liking to shove. Top and middle pairs are shoving. Overcards are randomly shoving, like Queen-Jack for a gut shot. You know, good overcards. So, kind of cool to see. Anyway, 7-5 does shove sometimes. Whenever you start to get sort of shallow, or actually super deep stacked, pairs with gut shots are actually pretty good. Got 10 blinds behind that bet. I cannot fathom min raising here. The stack-to-pot ratio is pretty <laughs> small. Maybe some hands are just so good, you don't even care if he sticks around. He's also thinking about the bet size that Saliba has chosen to use. What is this situation at the final table? No, this is just a situation in the middle stages of the tournament. <sighs> Seems like it's liking the swap to some extent. So we call. Just call. Find out what happens on the turn. 
Saliba might be able to cobble some real value out of this dusty 8-4 offsuit, depending on what develops. Now, all of a sudden, a second straight draw materializing courtesy of the Jack of Hearts. On all right, all right, all right. Jack of Hearts comes on the turn. What should Lycanin do? Should he have a leading range here? Justin has a pot size bet left. One pot size bet left. Well, I'll tell you, if you've studied the advanced tournament course at PokerCoaching.com, you will know that you should frequently have some leads when stacks are very, very shallow. And this is something a lot of people have not studied. Now, the question becomes, should we lead this hand? And I would venture to say no. In this spot, you probably want to be leading with a lot of nines and jacks and draws. That's what I would venture to say. But I have to imagine you're going to have some leads in this scenario because you do have a lot of jacks. Anytime the turn gives you some top pairs and your middle pairs are still very, very good, um, this is a spot where you should have some leads. Okay? Let's see what GTO does look like here. GTO does lead. Aces, kings, jacks. What else? King seven, queen seven, queen six. So gut shots again, right? Actually, seven's open-ended now, or double gut shot. Effectively the same thing. 9-8 shove sometimes, 8-5 shove sometimes, 9-5 some shove sometimes, so pretty good hands. So we're shoving a lot of hands that are almost always good but vulnerable, which makes sense. Uh, typically when you start to get shallow stack, those are hands that usually do rip it in. We are still checking a lot of our very good hands, but notice the jacks are shoving pretty often. Do the 9 shove? We don't actually have very many 9s at this point. If we did have a 9, we would shove some of them. I guess 9-8 is two pairs. So maybe we have no 9s at this point. We should have either led them or check raised them already. Cool to see. Cool to see. Let's see what Lycanin does. What does 7-5 do? 7-5 checks. 7-6 checks. 10-7 checks. Wait, what am I saying? We have a 5. 7-5 checks. 5-4, five, 5-3. Five, These are all similar-ish hands. 7-6 and 7-5 are basically the same. They check every time. On the turn for Lycanin. This card is getting pretty gross for both players. It just, your pair doesn't look so good. There's a lot in there. 195k in chips right. remaining to play for. And Saliba, did I hear correctly? No. No, no. it was Lycanin who announced all oh in. Oh my. Lycanin announced all in. Lycanin announced all in. What does that mean? Well, look, I'm going to tell you all something. This is a secret. This is a bit of a hack. When people shove in this spot, you want to ask yourself, do they shove the value hands? or only the bluffs, or perhaps just not the right range. And look, Lycanin's a good, strong, world-class player, one of the best players in the world. He does find an all-in, but notice it's not really a hand that likes an all-in. I, in this spot, I'll tell you what I would do. I would close my eyes and call. <laughs> it sucks, but I think you're going to see a lot of sevens and sixes and tens in this scenario. I think a lot of sevens and sixes and tens in this scenario are going to be overshoving, and I really don't think jack five, jack six, queen jack, king jack, nine eight. I don't think the good hands are shoving here ever. You might be shown something like I don't even know. You you might see a hand like um, jack six suited decide to shove, but I kind of doubt it, right? I think in this spot, when you do face the shove, it's going to be very very bluff heavy. So. The question is, what should Lycanin do in this spot facing the shove? Should you actually call or fold? Well, I just told you exploitatively, I think it's a pretty easy call. It's an annoying spot, but I think it's a pretty easy call. You may say, you wouldn't call here. This is armchair quarterbacking, but uh, I don't know if you see me play poker. I don't really like to fold. I don't like to fold because in spots like this, people typically over bluff. That is what they do. What a, what a play. play. What a play. It is a savage wow. play. Did not We're going to fast forward a bit. Situation. Justin gives it some thought. Think, 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 think. Something that came with some hearts? Five. Think, 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 think. I think it's... Bruno nails it. No way he shoved good hands. And I generally agree. Sometimes? Most people don't shove the good hands here. Maybe. Jack what? X? 
Why I, would I, the nine X take this line? I, I don't know. Ollie. So I don't know. I, neither do I. I, mean, I also I'm, don't know why it's a seven five second line, but it's a great play, and I love. Uh, one thing I want to also point out here is that notice he should shove twenty two percent of the time, right? That's kind of a lot. That is kind of a lot. That's kind of a lot. Most people don't shove in the spot, and most people don't even know what to do when they face a shove in the spot. You want to know why? Because they haven't studied shallow stacked poker. But especially as the super high roller tournaments allow re-entries and allow late re-entries, you do have to learn to play very, very well shallow stacked. And a lot of the best players in the world have spent a ton of time learning 15 big blind post-flop strategies, 20 big blind, and 25 big blind post-flop strategies. love it. I'm learning so much from this. Ah, this, it's a, they put us in the blender, and we get to see the whole cards. Yeah. I don't know why everyone's saying, put them in a blender now. It means they're putting you in a bad spot. I'll translate for all of you. That's amazing. Who could blame Saliba for putting bank, it in bank. the muck? But I'll tell you something. Putting in this many time banks to work means gears are turning in the right way upstairs mm -hmm. for Saliba. Who nice smells call. a rat and makes the call. Lycanin like gave it all he had with this 7-5. He knows he's got outs in case of emergency. It is nice. Notice here, even when he is behind, he has 30% equity, right? Like I said, GTO loves pair with gut shot. Once Saliba doesn't snap call, and no shortage of them, by the way. A 5, 6, 7, wrong. or 10 would spell disaster for Saliba. A lot to fade, and the deuce of spades is a beautiful river. Now, my question is, should Saliba have called in GTO World? Knowing this is the opponent's range, should, the op should Justin still call? And I'll tell you, because I've looked at these spots. I already know the answer is just yes. If your opponent has any sort of logical bluffs in this scenario, and especially if they don't shove the value hands, it's an easy call. But even if they shove the GTO range, you have to realize we only need to win 35% of the time. Pot odds. Pot odds exist. Pot odds exist. Pot odds exist. Let's see if GTO says call. Here's the GTO calling range. Let's take a look. Um, what's the worst hand we have here? Do we have any fives? Unfortunately, we have no fives. But it, okay, so if we did happen to have seven five off, so you can look at this tiny number here. It says to call ninety eight percent of the time. Six five calls ninety eight percent of the time. Five three folds. Five three folds. Four three folds. Eights obviously call. Nines obviously call. All the eights and nines call. Over pairs call. Everything else we have in our range is something. Uh, Ace queen actually calls about half the time. So it looks like bottom pair no kicker. And bad ace high, fold. Everything else calls. Ace 10 calls, by the way. Pot odds, again, right? This is a spot where we have a super, 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 duper, duper, duper easy call. Is it is the four better for us to have here than a 10, 6, or 7? No, it's way worse. Way, way worse. You would much, much, much prefer to have a gut shot. The gut shot gives you a lot more equity. But you have to realize, when you have a gut shot, you just get 10% more equity, right? Ace five call. No, ace five folds. Ace five here. Oh, well, funny enough, ace five does fold. I'm surprised ace five folds, but ace five folds. It looks like the five, with the five, you want to have something working. You want to have a, a gut shot or something with the five. What is king five? You don't get to see a king five. Oh, king five folds, queen five. Queen five calls randomly? Oh, queen five has a gut shot, right? So notice with the gut shot, you call with, with the five. And the eight's just good enough. Does any eight fold? Actually, you know, eight two folds. Maybe eight, eight, four, eight, five, eight, four folds some portion of the time, I guess. I don't know. Look, anyway, all this is to say, all of this is to say, in this situation, GTO thinks pairs are close, right? There's some cusp where it goes from like pair, bottom pair, middle pair plus draw, uh, Calls and then those hands without a kicker fold, right? But again, but again, if the opponent shoves too often, all of these bluff catchers become calls. 
This could be a spot where Justin should call literally everything in his range, assuming every, literally everything has some sort of a pair here, if he thinks the opponent bluffs too often, because remember, he only needs to win 35% of the time. Okay? We actually have two hacks here. When you're getting good pot odds against someone who's good and aggressive, don't fold. The other hack, though, is when someone bets too big in a spot where most people don't make these big leads with their value hands, they just might be heavily weighted towards bluffs. We're going to take a look at another hand featuring Oscar Brodkin, who I hear studies at PokerCoaching.com. He is going to be battling it out against Jonathan Jaffe, one of the absolute best poker players in the world. Let's get to it. In this scenario, we are playing with 150,000 big blind. Jonathan Jaffe is about 30 three big blinds deep. So we're playing 35 big blind deep poker. King queen suited, typically raises it up. 350. Fold it around to Oscar Brodkin. I would recommend Brodkin raises a little bit bigger. Uh, he goes for a little bit more than a min raise from out of position. I think you just want to raise bigger in general with everything, but whatever, he raises. And I believe this is the A7 is going to be nice, easy call. You don't want to re-raise and then get jammed. I don't think you want to just rip it in, although maybe maybe ripping it in is not the worst, but I, I would have just called in this spot in Jaffe's shoes. First pot that he's played since three betting king six suited. This time it is another spade king suited, and it takes it up to 350,000. Jaffe in the big with ace seven. If you like Jonathan Jaffe, click the like and subscribe button. Got position. He's third in chips. Brodkin is fourth. Three fifth. Defense. Smiling. <laughs> it's some it's like positive vibes. It's not the best. Ace eight seven is a positive development for Brodkin's gonna bet, obviously. Question is, should Brodkin bet? Should Brodkin bet in this situation? What do you think? King Queen on Ace eight seven. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Now look, typically hands that like to check are hands that are that have some showdown value that aren't all that likely to be outdrawn. But if you bet and get called, you're usually pretty unhappy. The question instead becomes though, is this a good enough flop for Brodkin's range to bet everything? Notice in this scenario, Brodkin's gonna have a lot of ASEX. A lot of good ASEX too. His ASEX is going to crush Jaffe's ASEX. Jaffe is going to have a lot of misses on this board. Jaffe's going to have a lot of a, a lot of misses on this board. A lot of, I, I realize he's going to have a lot of draws in this scenario, but he's also going to have a lot of misses. You got to realize Jaffe's going to call with all sorts of stuff preflop. Remember, Jaffe was getting incredibly good pot odds preflop. So Jaffe's only going to fold the absolute worst offsuit trash. So Jaffe's going to have a whole lot of stuff like. King high, queen high, jack high, 10 high. That just completely misses. I think a lot of you think in this scenario that Jaffe's range is stronger than it is. Because typically, if say like under the gun raises a big blind calls, the middle cards are pretty good for them. But in this spot, Jaffe's going to re-raise a lot of his best aces. So that means his aces lose to Brodkin's aces. And Brodkin's non-nut hands, like pocket tens, king, queen, etc., should probably, they're probably good against Jaffe's range as well. So I think this is why we can probably bet everything. And GTO recommends continuation bet, third pot, give or take, with everything. Maybe if we added in a lot more bet sizes, we could perhaps find some more checks. Notice some hands that do not mind checking. Like I said, stuff like king, queen, pocket kings, etc. These are hands that don't mind checking. But... This is definitely a board that is generally going to be good for Brodkin because he has a lot of good aces, right? Okay. Or Jaffe. Of course he shouldn't bet Jaffe has a seven. YouTube commentators, am I right? Who faces a snap 350 follow through from the King Queen suited. Now, now here's the question. Should Jaffe raise it with his two pair? Obviously, it's not going to go well against this hand, but should he raise in general in this spot with the a7? 
What do you think? I know what a lot of people do. They say, oh my god, two pair I raise. I don't want to get outdrawn. Seems like mixed views here. We Some say raise, some say call. Again, remember, we don't know Brodkin has a non-premium hand. And remember, this board should be pretty good for his range. But I can already tell you, the answer in this spot is going to be to call with basically everything. This is a board that heavily favors Brodkin. How do we know it heavily favors Brodkin? I just showed you we bet everything. Whenever your opponent bets with everything, it heavily favors their board, or heavily favors their range. So given this heavily favors his range, you should know if you study these spots, because Jaffe realizes Brodkin's range should be pretty good, my range should be pretty trash. I just don't get to raise much at all. I want to call with all my best hands, that which will allow me to then call with a lot of weaker hands. Okay? Here's Jaffe's strategy. Notice, basically no raises. No raises, just call. What are the worst hands we call with? That becomes the interesting question. What is the worst hand we call with? Notice, by the way, Jaffe has like all suited hands, a bunch of all suit junk, right? He has a lot of stuff here. So what is the worst hand Jaffe calls? Notice if he has king 10, he should call. Notice if he has jack 10 for a gut shot, he should call. Queen Jack should call. So notice, this is a spot where, like I said, Jaffe's range just doesn't hit this board all that well. And notice, facing the one-third pot bet, Jaffe's folding out 32% of his range. That's because his range started extremely wide. And, you know, honestly, Jaffe might call wider than this preflop. <laughs> Jaffe doesn't like to fold. So Jaffe's going to have even more of these kind of junkers in his range, I think. Maybe he three-bet bluffs them. Who knows? Again, these ranges are roughly GTO, but also hypothetical. Who knows exactly how the players are playing in these scenarios? Someone said earlier, aren't these players playing with more information and more reads and more past history? And, you know, maybe they are. Maybe they aren't. Maybe they don't care. Right? You have to realize these. a lot of these players are good, strong, world-class poker players. They don't really care if the player bluffed them last hand or if they showed up the nuts with the nuts last time or if they show up with the nuts three times in a row. They're not worried about that because they realize that if you show up with the nuts every single time, you're a fish. So most of these players are trying to play within reason pertaining to GTO. So anyway, Jaffe has the easy call. And notice in the spot, you should have basically no raises. I think a lot of people raise this spot far too often with their good hands and their draws, but you should not. In position, facing a bet against a strong range, you call. From Broadkin. Well, if you're a preflop raiser, it makes sense to continuation bet ace high boards. Expected to have all those aces. Jaffe, though. Mm, mm, Double check. Mm, 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 Top and bottom. That's an incorrect statement. Uh, Brodkin does not have all of his aces. Because he's going to limp some of them, and he's going to... He's going to limp some of them, was, is what it amounts to. So, Brodkin does not have all of his aces, but he has a lot of his best aces. Which is a very important point. He has a lot of aces, and he has a lot of best aces, and his range is proportionally tilted towards aces compared to Jaffe's range. Because, notice... Brodkin doesn't have all the aces, but he also doesn't have a whole lot of other stuff either, right? And also, pairs are pretty good. So he has pairs that are pretty good. He has a lot of aces. And Jaffe, while he does have more aces, his aces are weaker across the board, and he has a whole lot of garbage. So proportionally, Brodkin has more aces, but he doesn't have all the aces, okay? I guess the question is slow playing or raising. 350. Uh, slope uh, raising with here would be just atrociously bad by the way I want to make it crystal clear if you thought you should raise here it is a blunder it is an absolute blunder because when your opponent doesn't have anything which is going to be some chunk of the time he's going to fold and when he does have an ace you're going to stack him anyway so you take away his opportunity to bluff don't take away your opponent's opportunity to bluff if it is, he's going to slow play under yep. his hand. We've got our answer as another 700 slides into the middle. No spade on the flop, so no backdoor flush draw to be acquired. King, Quinn, King Queen adrift without a paddle, drawing dead after the deuce rolls off. And All right. Should King Queen keep bluffing? Should King Queen keep bluffing? Interesting question. A lot of people think automatically, no, why in the world would you keep bluffing? Hmm. 
Mm -hmm -hmm. I think here to bluff, you want to have some equity. This is a board where you're going to have a lot of good draws and a lot of junky draws like gut shots. And King Queen does have some showdown value. Not that you're going to get to realize it all that often, but it does have a little bit. So I think you probably want to check this one. But, 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 I bet slightly weaker hands are supposed to bluff. Like um, Queen 10, I bet bluffs. Queen 9 probably bluffs. I bet those type of hands bluff. So this is a spot where, especially if you have done a decent amount of studying, you may you may realize in the spot you probably should have some bluffs in the spot that have over cards to the 8s. <laughs> Let's take a look. In the spot, pot is 15 big blinds. Notice, when we bet, half pot bet's mostly used. King, queen does not bluff. But take a look at this. King, nine bluffs. Queen, jack bluffs. Queen, 10 bluffs. Queen, nine bluffs. Obviously, the gut shots bluff. Jack, 10, jack, nine. 10, nine for open-ended. Those are obviously bluffing. Um, even bad gut shots like 9-5 bluff, 6-4 bluffs, 5-4 for gut shot bluffs, 5-3, 4-3, etc. What I want to show here, though, is that lots of gut shots bluff and some junky unpaired high card bluffs, high cards bluff. So what most people do wrong in this spot is they under bluff. Almost no one finds queen jack, queen 10, queen 9 bluffs here. They just don't do it. They just don't do it. You don't see many hands that would fold, that would that would call the flop and then fold the turn. Well, if we bet the turn, we're going to be bluffing some portion of the time. I want to make that crystal clear. Is there an argument that King Queen has enough showdown value? I mean, there is some, but like not a lot because you're not going to get to see the showdown all that often. But notice in the scenario, we should be betting a decent chunk of the time. Take a look at the hands that check. Uh, some good top pairs check. A lot of give ups check. Middle pairs check. Some under pairs check. It is a little bit interesting to me to see t uh, Jack's 10s and 9s continue betting for, for just straight for value. And again, this comes from the fact that Jaffe has a whole lot of 8s and 7s that are not going to fold, right? So notice we get to value bet in this spot with a somewhat wide range. In this spot, I bet most people don't value bet pocket Jacks or pocket Queens. I, I bet they just never do it. I mean, I don't know if I would have done it here. I would have checked for sure, and that would have been a mistake, right? And this is why you have to study. These shallow stack spots are hard. And here we're not even that shallow stack. We're 30 big blinds deep, right? Stoka says that you you feel rough bluffing in this spot because you're going to get called a lot. And you have to realize, yeah, you are, but you're going to get folds on the river. A lot of time when you bet the turn, you're not extracting much, or you're not producing much equity at all by bluffing the turn, but you're going to produce equity by bluffing the turn plus the river. The idea that I'm going to check, check, turn, and then bluff the river would be, I mean, you you should do that with some hands, but then you're really not going to get any folds. But imagine your opponent does have a 7 or an 8. To be fair, I mean, we're about to look at Jaffe's range. I don't even know if he's supposed to call a 7 or an 8. And I'm sure an 8's supposed to call. I'm not sure about a bad 7, though. And a bad seven's always going to call the flop. If he turns a 2 somehow, I don't think he has very many 2s at all, but if he did have a 2, he, he may be supposed to fold. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway... In this scenario, let's see what Broad Broadkin does. Is it going to be a multi-street effort from Broadkin? Yeah, it's uh, yep. checking out some stacks. Possibly he's got a game plan with this. So look, I think Broadkin is not known to be a high stakes crusher. I don't know how he got in this tournament, but he's in this tournament. And... Most people who, let, I don't know if he satellited them, but most people who satellite in or most people who are not so known in the poker world drastically under bluff. So if I have the read that you drastically under bluff, what should you do? Well, the answer is drastically over bluff. It's not going to work this time. Oh boy. Bet again. But he does try it. Targeting. Look, I like seven this. and eight. Seven fifty. Which would have to give credit to this. It could easily be an ace. Sorry. Betting this. I don't mind the bet. I think it's actually a pretty so pretty solid bluff. And if if I had the read that this player maybe is kind of on the tighter side. They said he hasn't played a hand in a while. 
And if I had the read that this player probably doesn't want to come off out here and just bluff off a stack, how many people are left in this tournament? We are at the final table here, by the way. Seven out of 171 remain. Most people aren't trying to just bluff it off for all the money. So what should Jaffe do now? Should Jaffe call or should he raise with this two pair? Plus draws available now. Take a second. Think about it. Write it in the chat. What would you do here with the two pair? What do I think about his sizing? I think it's probably reasonable. Maybe even bigger is better. Notice in this spot we do see that we gave the solver the two options here, small bet and big bet, medium bet. And it picked the medium bet every time. If I had to rerun this, I would probably um, run it again with bigger sizes. Maybe you're supposed to pot it, for all I know. Some people say raise. Some people say call. I can already tell you, don't raise. Don't raise. He's drawing dead a lot of the time. And you're going to stack the aces anyway. Don't raise. Don't raise. Don't raise. Don't raise. If you raise here, you are making a mistake. Nice and easy. Let's look at GTO before we see what Jaffe does. Notice we're calling the vast majority of the time. Basically no raises ever. We do see some raises with hands that are almost always good but vulnerable. Mainly 8-7 plus some bluffs. 7-6 is the hand that it seems like that likes bluffing. 7-6 and 6-4. I presume this has a flush draw. Notice the bottom two pairs are raising. What should Jaffe fold here, by the way? Should Jaffe fold any pair? Should he fold any ace? No, obviously. Any 8? No. Any 7? So look, notice nine, seven folds, seven, six folds sometimes. Looks like that's the hand that's being used as the bluff. If we do bluff, by the way, we're not raising all in, we're raising small. Um, do any twos fold? No, twos do not fold. It's kind of cool to see. Uh, sixes and lower folds a lot of the time. Neat, right? Again, not a whole lot of raises from ace eight and ace seven. Some raises from ace eight, not a lot though. And it does make sense that if you are going to raise here, you want to raise with the hands that are almost always good but vulnerable. And obviously, like, 8-2 is way more vulnerable than a 7 This way. And to be fair, in this spot, I probably don't really have any raises. I just call everything. Because, again, this is a spot where, like commentator here said, it's very easy for uh, Brodkin to have a good ace. And you just don't want to raise into a range that contains a lot of good aces in general. If he was out of position, it would probably be okay to raise. Yes, he's not out of position. He is in position very important when you're studying poker to try to study specific scenarios or very very similar scenarios and whenever you swap positions it's not a similar scenario anymore at all and it will play very differently the big question for jaffe now is do i call again or do i raise depends on what he thinks if oscar could get away with the weak ace if he does then he wants to keep slow playing this right as that hand kind of disagree with that as well you're not really worried about letting Brodkin get out of the pot here. You're worried about, with, with, with an ace, you're worried about Brodkin getting out of the pot with queen high or jack high, right? Because they showed you queen high and jack high should continue bluffing a decent chunk of the time. And draws dead. Seven fifty. When you have a good strong value hand like this, that's not that vulnerable, you are really concerned with keeping the garbage in. You're not so concerned with how do I stack other good hands when you're not that deep stacked. You're really concerned just how do I keep my opponent's range as wide as possible. Jaffe elects to flat. And this opens the door for Brodkin to do something really poorly timed on the river, unimproved. I mean, look at the stacks. Backdoor, Backdoor clubs. clubs. Should Brodkin bluff? I don't know. We're already kind of far off of GTO world at this point because we saw King Queen should be checking the majority of the time. But I have to imagine if Brodkin had a club, he should probably bluff here. Like pretty, pretty easily bluff. And, you know, I would not actually be shocked if we got to the river with a random brick King Queen. King Queen random brick might actually bluff the river in GTO world because you don't have a ton of other great logical bluffs. Um, I have to imagine you want to have a club though. That's a real thing. Very credible. Oh, look, <laughs> look at the body language on this one. He's Two summoning. Five. He's summoning his strength. Two, three, three million, maybe? Let's have a count. Wow. Uh, I just, I'm, I'm showing, but yeah, yeah, okay. the clock. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. 
Look, <laughs> if I was in Jaffe's shoes, no way would I think Brodkin's bluffing in the spot. Most people don't. Most people, whenever they're bluffing, they're not so loose. They're not so loose. By the way, you're not allowed to ask your opponent how many, can, can I get a count of your chips? You're not allowed to do that in, in the poker game. You are allowed to say, let me see your chips. But you're not allowed to ask, um, give me a count, unless the money has gone into the pot already. Or if the chips are like in a just a ridiculous mess somehow, then I guess you can. But even then, they're just going to stack them up in 20 sacks. Counting down the stack to see if he can make a move. I actually love a bluff here. It's not going to work, obviously, but I love the bluff. All of it. All in. Oh, my God. <laughs> Brodkin is jamming. He has Jaffe narrowly covered here. I don't know. Now, now, should, ja should Jaffe ever fold the A7? Obviously not. But this is one of these spots where if you think your opponent is under bluffing for whatever reason, then stuff like an ace starts to become pretty marginal. Like an ace definitely going to fold. What about a hand like A6? Should an A6 fold? Probably. It blocks some obvious bluffs. I don't know. I don't know. This is a spot where I think a lot of pros in Jaffe's shoes, I'm um, not saying Jaffe in particular, but I think uh, I think a lot of people in this spot, if you tell me I think my opponent's going to underbluff, they probably drastically overfold in this scenario. But Jaffe has two pairs, not going to fold. I'll tell you all another secret in poker. Uh, another hack that I did not write down. Don't fold two pair. Even when the straight and the flush come in. I don't know if Jaffe can get away from aces and sevens. Yeah. And I just, forgive me, covered up Jonathan saying as much. All of it. All in. It's good. Wow. Damn. <laughs> Damn. You really don't hope to be running into a seven. But look, Jaffe played this hand excellently. And I think Brodkin, you got to give him, give him a lot of credit for going for it. I think a lot of people don't go for it here. And I think if his hand was slightly weaker, GTO would definitely recommend going for it. And sometimes you run into it. Sometimes you run into it. The hack here, though, is with a premium hand in position on a relatively dry, uncoordinated flop facing a bet, it is best to force your opponent to stay in the pot. So many people make the mistake of letting their opponent get out of the pot. Do not, do not, do not let your opponent get out of the pot when you are drawing, when, when they are drawing to not that many outs most of the time. And you got to realize, sometimes they're having a straight draw. Sometimes they're having a backdoor flush draw. Sometimes they're going to hit on you. They're not going to hit on you. They're going to they're gonna spike on you. And it's not going to work out. Sometimes you're going to lose with those two pairs by slow playing. But in exchange for getting out drawn some portion of the time, you let your opponent have the chance to bluff. And a lot of players, especially once they get to the high stakes, they know how to bluff and they're not afraid to bluff. And you really, really, really want to give them that opportunity. You all want to go through one more hand? Or should we pack it up? What do you think? I did say three hacks. I guess we'll go through three hacks. All right, fine. Let's take a look at this hand. Here I have a hand from PokerCoaching.com in our advanced tournament course featuring two crushers, Justin Sleba and Brock Wilson. These players work together. They study together. They improve their skills together. This is from Justin Saliba's recent $10,000 buy-in online tournament bracelet win. He has two bracelets. Congrats to him. I have zero. He's a lot better at poker than I am. Let's take a look at this hand. We're not going to listen to Brock and Justin's talk in this because this hand actually runs a little bit long. They discuss it thoroughly in depth. Um, but we're going to just observe this hand and take a look at it. So in this hand, we are pretty deep in the tournament. I'm not sure if we're at the final table or not. But Pete Chen, loose, aggressive, battling player, raises up to three big blinds. Queen Jack offsuit, 25 big blinds, deep, effective. What should we do with this hand 25 big blinds deep. Effective. Do I have a chart for this? Let's see. I do not. 25 big blinds deep. Effective. I'm going to tell you, you just call a lot, okay? Queen Jack likes to call. Trust me on this one. You can look it up on the charts. So. So, 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 so. Fast forward a little bit. Fast forward a little bit. All right, flop comes. Not going to be able to fast forward, obviously. There we go. 
Flop comes. 10, 10, 8. Pete Chen checks. Should we bet with the Queen Jack? Should we bet with Queen Jack on 10, 10, 8? Take some time. Give it some thought. What do you think? Someone said 3-bet preflop. You do not 3-bet King, Queen, Offsuit preflop in almost all scenarios. I think on 10, 10, 8, at this stack depth, you definitely want to check it back. This is a common thing that happens in tournaments where you really don't want to bet a draw that has to fold if you get jammed. And right here, if you bet the queen jack on 10, 10, 8 for any amount, Pete can easily shove or raise, and that's going to put you in a miserable spot with your hand. So this is a spot where when you're going to bet, you're going to want to bet with your hands that are very happy to get the money in, like a lot of 10s. You're also going to want to bet with high equity draws that can not fold to a shove. This is going to be good flush draws. Flush draws with straight draws, stuff like that. And then we're going to bet with some junky draws. Junky draws here are going to be hands like one over card, like Jack. I mean, like, like yeah, maybe, maybe something like Queen Seven of Diamonds or King Seven of Diamonds. That might even be too good. You might just want to bet stuff like one over card, like King X, stuff like that. Um, maybe bad gut shots can bet like nine six. You probably don't mind betting the 69 and folding it to a raise. But Queen Jack's definitely not going to be a bet here. Because if you bet Queen Jack and get raised, it is terrible. Okay? Also, Pete can easily be checking with good hands. Fine. Turn is an 8. Pete's going to give it some thought. He half pots. All right. Half pot bet. 10, 10, 8, 8. 10, 10, 8, 8. Pete bets half pot. What do we do now? Take a second. Think about it. Do we fold, call, or raise? Kind of a gross spot. Let's talk about Chen's flop decision. Here is GTO flop decision for Pete Chen. We see lots of bets, lots of checks. He's going to be playing a very mixed strategy across the board, okay? Common stuff. Notice, Queen Jack does actually bet the flop sometimes. I was slightly off on that. Stuff like 9-6 bet a lot. Yeah, 9-6 bets a lot. Random overcard bets a lot, right? Like we talked about. Lots of 10s bet. 8s bet. You know, stuff like that. Uh, a lot of junk junkers bluff. Fine. Now, Chen's decision on the turn. After he checks the flop, on this turn, he doesn't really bet all that often. When he does bet, though, take a look at the hands he's mostly betting. He's going to be betting with mostly 8s and not actually betting with 10s very often at all, which is kind of surprising to me. But the reason he's not betting all these 10s is because he has a whole lot of ace highs and a whole lot of king highs and a whole lot of queen highs that could be good that really want to see the showdown. So in this scenario, he has to do a lot of checking in order to make his range substantially stronger when he does check. Okay? That makes sense. So, what should Justin do with his queen jack? Can he fold it? Well, are we playing in GTO world or not? I will say that Justin said that he'd been a little bit cautious in the big blind in general so far, and he thought that Pete might be a little bit too wide. If your opponent's a little bit too wide, you certainly can't go around folding over cards. That would be ridiculous. Here's GTO in Justin's shoes facing the half pot bet. We're only really folding... King high, queen high, jack high, no draw. We're folding under under cards, which are trash. We are sticking around with flush draws. We're calling, though, with queen high with a draw and king high with a draw. Even a little bit of king high sticks around as well. Obviously, ace high is going to call. So, you see queen jack here is 100% call. A lot of you in chat said fold. A lot of you in chat said fold. I'm not going to go through and watch this entire video that... that these two crushers made together. But Brock, without looking at this hand, said, you know, when people make this type of play, I think this is just, that's total airball bluff. And he was right. How does he know? I don't know. He's played a bazillion hands and he studied a lot and he knows that when it goes check, check, some people can't help themselves. Spoiler alert, Justin calls after a ton of thought between these two players. They discuss it a lot in our advanced tournament course. All right, River's a queen. He checks. 
Pete checks. Pete checks. So, is Queen Jack good enough to bet for value? What do you think? Is Queen Jack good enough to bet for value in this situation? Oh, God. This is one of these spots in tournaments where your hand is almost always good. Almost always good. But is it good enough to value that? We can easily get called by Queen High here. But Queen High is not all that likely, right? This is a, one of these weird scenarios where in poker, quite often you do have the best hand, but if you bet and get called or bet and get raised, it is miserably bad. Someone just said before it scrolled through, bet 35K. In position, on the river, you should almost never bet small. Small bets on the river in position are almost always not advised. Because when you bet, you're going to get shoved sometimes. And that's really, 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 really bad. There's a gigantic cost to betting against good players because they will check raise you sometimes and then make you fold your equity, which is a disaster. So the question is, is Queen Jack good enough to bluff? And these players talked about this for quite a while. They thought it was close. They both thought it was close, actually. Um, Justin, after the fact, was erring towards value bet. Brock said he thought it was not quite good enough to value bet. I would have probably checked it back myself. Justin actually did check it back in game. In this scenario, on the river, what should Chen be doing? He should be betting with eights and tens, of course. Uh, and then some bluffs. Jack high that's there. Nine high that's there. We can even value bet with some over pairs if he has them. Notice when he does check, though, sometimes he does have um, aces and kings and queens some portion of the time. He is checking some eights some portion of the time, right? So I said that he's like almost always good, but not every time. And whenever we do value bet, we're only going to get called by like Queen Jack, right? And Queen 7 and Queen 3 that are there. And there's really not a ton of those. And we block them to death anyway. So what should Justin do? Notice when he bets the river, I already told you this, he's either betting half pot or bigger. In GTO world, you basically never bet tiny on the river. Period. When you are in position after your check two. You just don't bet tiny. There's another hack for you. It's not even covered today. We discussed this in... The Tournament Masterclass and the Cash Game Masterclass. This is one of the rules that is almost always set in stone. In position, on the river, when they check to you, half pot or bigger. If your hand's not good enough for half pot, you don't bet it. Queen Jack. <clears throat> Look at that. Right on the cusp. Queen Jack bets sometimes and checks sometimes. King Queen mostly bets. On the river, whenever you are value betting, you usually structure your range such that you have some gigantic bets with your nuts and some bluffs. And then a smaller bet size, usually pot or half pot or some of a mixture of those with your non-nut hands. So take a look at this. Pot is uh, 13 big blinds. We can uh, bet 18 big blinds in this scenario. Is that all of our money? That is all his money. So we can bet 18 big blinds in this scenario with full houses, right? Full houses are just good enough to go for all of it most of the time, right? We do have some big bluffs as well. Notice king high and jack high. These are going to be draws that missed. King high and jack high are mostly shoving in this scenario. Strong, right? Notice um, those are mostly of our bluffs. We have some nine high bluffs. We do have some undercard busted flush draw bluffs. And notice all of these are bluffing because this scenario, our range is very, very good. Our range is very, 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 very good. So when our range is very, 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 very good, we get to have a lot of bluffs. So the question becomes, which hands are the hands that do need to be bluffing in this spot? And usually when you're bluffing, you want to block your opponent's hands that will never, ever fold. But in this scenario, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense because obviously a 10 and 8 and a queen are just not folding and everything else is going to call. So it's not like we can block flushes or straights so much. I mean, we could show, we could block jack 9, and we do see all the jacks and all the 9s bluffing. But essentially, we're just loading it up from the bottom up at this point because the, the hands at the bottom also are the hands with blockers to some extent. And uh, we're, we're betting pretty frequently. Notice, though, we can't quite go with the queen jack. Do we have queen nine? Yeah, we can't quite go with queen nine. Definitely can't go with queen nine. And Brock said he thought it'd be a check. Justin actually checked in game but thought it was close. I would have checked it back because I'm a nit. And it looks like that is right on the line. Fun stuff, tough stuff. Congrats to all of you if you got them right. Understand, hack number two, hack number three, can't even count.
please, please, please make a point to study a lot because they're going to help you learn to put players on ranges better. And also they're going to teach you how to play these spots that come up over and over and over and over and over and over again. My question for you is, do you want to learn directly from these three crushers? Brock Wilson, Justice Sleva, and Jonathan Jaffe. Well, if you do, I have seven additional videos for you that you can go get right now at pokercoaching.com slash ATC. We discuss our advanced tournament course. It has content from Brock Wilson, Jonathan Jaffe, Justin Sleva, me, also Matt Affleck, and Rampage Poker, who's been on an absolute rampage recently winning almost everything. We discuss all sorts of advanced tournament topics not discussed in the tournament masterclass. If you don't know this, at pokercoaching.com, if you're a premium member, you have full access to everything on the site. And we have a tournament masterclass that's about 40 hours long with lots of quizzes. It's very interactive and it will teach you all the common spots. But there are some corner cases, spots that, you know, they get a little bit dicey, they get a little bit tricky. We have a big session, a big set, big section on how to play with shallow stacks in the advanced tournament course because you need to know how to play these scenarios. Like the first thing we went through today, 15 big blind poker. That's a dicey one. But you need to make sure you are studying these spots. We also discuss how to adjust to various final table payouts. We added a bunch of ICM charts recently to the Poker Coaching app. We're going to continue adding more and more there. Justin Sleba, when he won that $10,000 buy-in tournament, actually recorded himself in time playing a lot of the tournament. And then he won the bracelet. We have that recorded for you in real life game time play with Justin talking out all of his thoughts, winning a $10,000 buy-in online tournament. We discuss heads up play a lot. Jonathan Jaffe is an absolute crusher at heads up. Him and Justin Sleva played a ton of heads up as uh, practice for Justin, practice for Jonathan. And we have lots and lots of GTO charts for those scenarios as well. Anyway, we have seven free videos you can go get right now. I'll be quiet. I know you all want to get to it. Head over to pokercoaching.com slash ATC to get those seven videos and continue studying all week long. Get in there. Good luck. Have fun. Make the most of your opportunities. I'm doing everything I can to give you the knowledge you need to succeed at poker tournaments in 2023. I made pokercoaching.com to be the site that I want to study from and the site that I want to learn from. And hopefully you all do too. Good luck in your games. Have fun. Thank you for being here. If you enjoyed today's show, do me a favor. Click the like and subscribe buttons down below. Go ahead, do it. Click them, click them, click them. And then head over to pokercoaching.com slash ATC right now to continue working hard and studying and improving your game. I'll talk to all of you next time.